um, thank you so much. Thank you so much for for coming, taking time and and, and come here. Um, uh, obviously, my birthday being main reason. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you, David, and the Data Idols for organizing everything so well. Um, I, I found it very, very stressful, so I don't know how you guys do it every day for a week. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, thank you so much. So today, uh, uh, we're going to be talking about some stuff that we, uh, we, we've we done uh, over the last three years. Um, so just to kind of uh, as well uh, talk a little bit about old versus new and startup versus big and so on. I think um, I'm going to kind of explain it a bit. Yes, we are here in the 160 year old um, publisher, uh, but uh, our team and the capabilities that we are building with uh, obviously awesome team made of superheroes and, uh, and um, princesses and, and stuff. Um, yeah. Um, but we kind of a uh, that's a very new and we operate for last um for last few years as a, as a as a startup within a big organization and that's a very important because uh, important point because that kind of dictates how we operate and what kind of a fights we need to do to uh, to actually achieve what what we think is right from the data perspective and to advocate for for data being an asset um in the uh, at the telegraph and i think only now, after a few years of operating like this and really, really hard work, we can see some effects of this and we can see that translating into real value. And also, you know, we are able to stand in front of you and, and present what we think is, is, is quite um, interesting. So anyway, uh, oh yeah, by the way, so uh, this is all, <laughs> I think you've probably seen that slide many times, but this is real fun is going on here. Um, so we're hiring, we're hiring for a lead data scientist at the moment. Brian, do you want to apply? <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, so please talk to me or, or hire for anybody from the team uh, who's here. Uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting opportunity. Um, and yeah, so if you kind of uh, look look behind you, and, and hopefully you kind of uh, had a, had the chance to to see our newsroom. So this is um, 160 uh, uh, years of history sitting down there, and um, you know, kind of a hard work of of the journalists that that build that this organization. Um, and I think recently we started to. Um, articulate our uh, mission and, and vision and who we really really are as a brand as well and um, you know you can as it reads here the telegraph exists to provide content to inspire people to have the perspective they want to progress and they want to progress in life and one of the key key points here is um, content content and the articles and the journalism that we produce is obviously our main asset so uh, everything that you can read on the paper, newspaper, on a broadsheet or online is, um, is our asset. That's the main thing that we are actually producing. Um, some people might recognize those slides because I need them uh, from somebody else. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, but <laughs> um, this is to, to kind of present some of the changes that go on that are going on in uh, in the industry, um, and that is the big digital um, revolution that happened uh, probably about over 20 years ago. And in 1994, um, Telegraph has decided as one of the first um, first publishers to actually go online. And this is how our first uh, very starting HTML page looked like. Uh, was updated once uh, in 24 hours, uh, once a day, and we kind of uh, published snippets of informa uh, information because obviously people wouldn't be able to consume all that vast information through the, the digital interface. Um, but um, what kind of a change and, and, and grown over the years um, is that kind of a, a evolution of all the digital assets that we that we have. So currently we are publishing on, we have a website, we have apps, we have uh, different ways of communicating with the user. Our landscape, even now over the last few year, um, few months, uh, really is changing massively because we have things like Google AMP that is kind of uh, impacting our advertising um, model. Uh, we have Facebook, we have all those, I'm looking at Rob because, <laughs> because he knows how it works. Uh, because that kind of uh, impacted how we monetize our content. Uh, and um, 
we need to figure out smarter and smarter ways uh, to, um, to try to, uh, to do it. Um, one of the challenges that happened in that 1994 uh, or somewhere shortly after was the fact that, well, we thought that it's okay to, to basically give away our main asset for free on the web. Um, so we, we basically published everything that we've got uh, for free uh, for anybody who can, who can view. So hence the advertising became such a big, um, big deal. Um, so um, that kind of, uh, again, gives us a big challenge, but also the digital world gives us a massive opportunity. And this is where we come to, to the current state of play, uh, that is um, anybody who has visited us digitally, we know what they do and we can imply potentially who they are and what they want and uh, we can interact with them um, in a very different way than we used to when they were reading the paper. Uh, so uh, kind of a long story short in terms of um, how the digitalization translated into, um, into our vast kind of a collection of data. Um, that's how we did it in um, at the Telegraph. We, it took us a few years. Um, we went through uh, many up and downs, um, building um, infrastructure then deleting it, then building again, then deleting it again, and, and then kind of uh, establishing a framework and a, and a technology that works for us. Um, so currently we are with uh, Google BigQuery uh, and uh, as a kind of a main, uh, main uh, platform for uh, the data lake. Um, I wasn't a big fan at first of the migrating everything uh, from AWS to, to Google, but I think now uh, we, see, we see definitely returns in terms of the um, accessibility and, um, and, and throughput. So uh, definitely um, kind of helped us move along uh, much faster. Um, in terms of the data sets, um, it's a kind of ever growing and never finished product. Um, um, we always going to have new pipelines. We're always going to have new sources. We're always going to have a, a kind of a, a combination of very structured and, and com or very modeled and completely unmodeled um, data sets. Uh, but uh, kind of a majority of the um, of the data is our web tracking um, kind of a behavior of the user, uh, including advertising. We actually store the DFP data for uh, for uh, ads, um, single customer review, so kind of a known um, known part of uh, of data sets, and that that all kind of uh, comes together on in in one platform. So um, the um, once we figure out the access, or we gave uh, the data scientists and smart heads, other smart heads um, and superheroes um, and princesses um, access to to data, we could start thinking about so who and how we can help within the organization. So I'm kind of again point Rob, advertising um, is um, you know something that uh, is about 80% of our revenue. Um, it is a declining market. Um, a lot of challenges, somebody talked about ad blockers. Yeah, very short lived pleasure for the user, uh, but a kind of a long term effect on publishers. We're basically going to die if you're going to continue ad blocking us. Um, so, um, so how can we, what are the ways to utilize data uh, so that we can raise up to that challenge um, and also to raise up to the comp competitors that not necessarily existed in the past? Um, our main competitors on the adver advertising scene are Google and Facebook and, and all the big guns uh, who, first of all, have massive experience in that and second of all, have, have a completely different data sets because they actually know, um, know a lot about, about the user because people log in. Uh, so we um, are going to talk about a product that we've uh, recently um, kind of released to the kind of a market and, and more specifically give to the user internally here to work with to, to kind of a build intelligent uh, or build more intelligence about the, the, the reader. We call it Telegraph AI. Um, AI does not stand for artificial intelligence, unfortunately. <laughs> 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 it does sound smart though. Um, 
It stands for Telegraph Audience Interest. Um, <laughs> you see what we've done here? You see, exactly. <laughs> um, so, um, so, okay, so the first, the first problem, um, you know, kind of uh, for, the, for the publisher um, is, and for the publisher who aims to create and understand more about the user and therefore be able to create um, premium audiences, uh, so, so more interesting audiences for the advertisers, is that problem of um, is what you read uh, indicative of what you are interested in? Um, because you know, surely, if I asked everybody or anybody here in the in the room, what 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 do you read? You'd say technology, science, business, and all those serious um, serious topics that surely you you do read. But then you probably you know kind of catch yourself uh, browsing Kim Kardashian pictures or um, just accidentally, um, <laughs> uh, and. Uh, so, so that's kind of a challenge for me because I see all of your browsing history and then I'm being confused. Well, so are you really interested in technology or um, whatever uh, nonsense that is? Uh, so, um, so we try to kind of um, do a little bit more research uh, into that, that matter. Uh, and by the way, I don't think we we have a final or uh, like a definitive answer, and that's a that's an open problem for everybody uh, in uh, in media, uh, uh, whether it's broadcasting or, or publishing. Uh, but we did some analysis on um, our readers, and we built a kind of a, a segmentation and, and, and clusters around uh, people's content behavior. Uh, mixed with people's engagement, and, te and then we overlaid the uh, kind of a polling and, and surveying information. So uh, that's you know my kind of um, or our way to incorporate the thick data uh, uh, sets, as Trisha Wang's uh, call it, um, calls it, um, with with big data and try to have a di deep kind of an analysis of. Uh, correlation between your reading patter patterns and de declared um, interests. And actually, it's not all uh, bad news. Uh, we actually managed to, to say that, yeah, well, in 80% um, of cases, you probably read the content that you, you, you express uh, that you are interested in. So that's good news, um, and that you can kind of build, build, build up on that. However, um, the kind of subsequent problem to understanding people's behavior or interest is the the data about content. So, uh, you know, in all our um, competence uh, around publishing articles and writing good good journalism or journalism, um, we need to kind of then classify and we need to, in a systemat systematic way, capture what the content is about. Um, we were coming from when we kind of started to look into what content people read. Uh, the only information we would have is uh, very granular, so the actual text of the of the article and very high level, um, which is section. So every every time somebody asks me, "Hey, what content is doing well?" I would say news, because <laughs> <laughs> everything is in news. So um, that doesn't necessarily give us much information about about the interest um, luckily of last um, last year um, we have changed a little bit the way we publish and um, and we migrated from a kind of a legacy uh, um, content management system into into a new one that allowed a little bit more more kind of a, they overlaid or forced the the, the journalists into um, annotating and creating more intelligent and more uh, more metadata about about the content. Um, so we started to kind of have an input of uh, or some notion uh, of a kind of a tagging um, that is a kind of a mixture of a automatically suggested um, entities uh, in in a kind of an NLP sense um, that cover people, organizations, places, and and things, uh, and some kind of a mixture of of uh, ontologies um, to kind of a capture what the content is about. I'm going to talk a little bit more later about 
imperfection of current system, but hey, better than what it used to be. So, um, so we um, kind of build up a um, or made that data, that specific tagging data, more accessible to um, to data scientists, but also to the the actual users um, in the uh, in in the teams. So. Um, we kind of build a little app that um, is called Audience Builder. Um, uh, and um, it's mainly used by um, people uh, who work on the commercial with commercial teams uh, that would kind of uh, create insights around uh, sizes of different specific segments that relate to, to interest. So for example, and it's, it's not, there is very little science in this. It's a filtering, uh, method of using the information that we currently have about content and then kind of creating or sending some queries to um, to the to the uh, behavioral data and then coming back with what users have a defined or a priori defined segment. So in this example, for example, uh, this example, for example, um, we have um, a segment of people who are interested in cars and motoring uh, and kind of a viewed um, two articles of the last 30 days with that specific tag. Uh, so not very kind of complicated, but also kind of a giving car enthusiast um, a segment, then, then you know, we can kind of start analyzing and looking into. So, so car enthusiasts um, um, kind of, a, again, defined in a very simplistic way, uh, but uh, the, um, when the kind of a more uh, intelligent thing comes in uh, or uh, is interesting for both for our inside teams and for the advertisers is so what are the underlying trends in, uh, in that general car enthusiast um, um, uh, articles? Um, and this is where um, we kind of thought, well, that's a great, that's a great case to kind of um, use some of the kind of topic modeling methodologies to understand, okay, I have this wide segment of car enthusiasts. It's not very specific and not, not very kind of a well-defined or anything, but then I can use that subset of articles um, and analyze what are underlying topics um, within that segment. Um, so we use an, uh, kind of an LDA, which is again, I mean, probably many of you are um, are familiar with the methodology, um, very easy, um, and uh, have lots of implementations that are quite easy to uh, to prototype. We use this uh, this kind of a Genzim uh, uh, Python library, um, and um, and kind of um, started to um, look into how how that could perform. And the way we tested it, we. Um, we worked with the business and we work with the uh, with the users to um, to get the get the feedback. So here's a little bit more of science um, in terms of how how LDA works. Um, I think uh, I'm gonna let her then kind of talk a little bit more of how we scale it out to uh, to a bigger problem. But uh, generally, it's a, it's a probabilistic model, so it assumes. Uh, it, uh, that the there is a num that the text the articles are built up of topics and then each topic is built up of words so uh, it gives for each of the words in a, in a cluster it gives a probability of uh, of each word to to belong to that cluster and also a probability of each topic to belong to that uh, to that document um, so that gives a very easy or very easy to visualize um, uh, kind of a, a picture of those are the different clusters within that group of documents that you earlier defined as documents that relate to the car enthusiast. And this is an example output. So we would have a car enthusiast um, and a kind of a top five words ordered by that probability that belong to each of the clusters. And you know, obviously you can have much more words, you can have some example articles, but we found that, well, actually, that, fi that top uh, five 
where it kind of gives you some idea of what could be the actual label for that cluster. Uh, and I think that's, that's what we would like to give or wanted to give to the business is the ability to interpret um, what, the, what the outcome is. So in this example, you can see the smallest cluster, which is an indication of the, um, of the traffic of the number of car enthusiasts that are actually visiting the articles that belong to that cluster, uh, is cars, but something that is related to film. Uh, then there is a cluster around buying a car, a cluster around more kind of a driving kind of a guides and so on. There is something about luxury cars, um, car reviews, and then the kind of actually the biggest biggest cluster is more related to uh, car industry and, and, and the business, which is kind of a not a surprise because um, our core and, and most engaged users um, engage mostly with, uh, with business. Uh, so that gives a very interesting set of data points uh, for data points about content and also data points about users. Because uh, we can then go to the um, editorial team and say, well, actually, when you write about, when you look in the car section, actually, the quite a big interest is around business and the industry. So maybe we should kind of uh, deliver or provide more content uh, around this. And then it translates also into advertising because when we create native advertising hubs, we can think about, uh, well, the, if somebody wants to sell cars uh, it, it, you know, and, and advertise them, maybe we would like to focus on that kind of a business content. Or if we want niche, we can kind of think about maybe some kind of a film, film related um, um, articles. <coughs> but the thing as well about reading behaviors, as we kind of found out um, earlier on on the Kim Kardashian example, is that, well, people read also other topics. So, I mean, how many car articles really you can read? So, you most likely also read some other stuff. Um, and, and that's another kind of angle of looking at that kind of enthusiasts um, of a specific topic is what are other things that they're reading. And this is basically a visualization. Uh, I'm totally supportive of visualization as well. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, this is telling you what other topic tags uh, the car enthusiasts are also interested in. So, uh, well, obviously cars. Um, uh, so um, that doesn't really give you much information, uh, <laughs> but but also you know there is a, some kind of uh, area that is around obviously Brexit and, and and EU and and kind of a more politics, which makes sense. Many people would read about it, so most likely you would meet or have a chance of of um, draw, attracting a car enthusiast on that content. Uh, <laughs> American elections. But what's actually quite interesting here is that a lot of car enthusiasts are also into m female tennises. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> I wonder whether they're 55 plus and male as well. Um, so that, that's something that is, um, it's an important and interesting insight that, that um, you know, whatever we decide, wherever we decide to take it, but that's something that uh, we wouldn't know if we, if we didn't look at this. Um, through other things uh, and, and clusters and behavioral clusters. So, okay, so we have that, you know, this is the, that subset of, of car enthusiasts core content that has sub subsections. And we also have um, content that, that um, um, the car enthusiasts are reading, but is not about cars. Um, so that means that potentially we have some people who would be interested in cars but are not reading cars on the Telegraph. They maybe read about cars somewhere else, but they read uh, the Telegraph um, for some other topics. Um, so, so this is where we decided to also uh, create a kind of an enthusiast index uh, for each of the articles to uh, kind of identify um, what uh, is the kind of a power of uh, attracting a specific enthusiast to every article that we that we publish? 
Uh, and that gives us, again, very interesting data point uh, about the content, uh, but also um, allows us to pick up the enthusiasts of cars and people who would be interested in buying them, potentially, uh, but they never kind of landed on, uh, on the car section or car kind of a um, core car um, content. Uh, obviously, you know, that, that would have different thresholds and you kind of are moving into, a, again, a probabilistic world where you say, well, that article you can um, uh, sell the space, the advertising space on that article to a car reseller, uh, but kind of say, well, it's going to have 60% of chances um, um, of kind of a driving att attention of, uh, of cars. So there is a lower quality of, of, of that um, uh, segment, but it's still kind of a probabilistically uh, over indexes across, um, across the other content. So, um, so Telegraph AI um, ha has become a quite a viral uh, product uh, within the commercial teams and um, and product teams, and we we also realized that it's a um, it's a great component of other things, and uh, I think that's quite an important strategic point that we try to live up to as a team. Uh, is to, to build elements of different systems and when we build something then reuse it in some other context. Um, so uh, that Telegraph, and B, um, Telegraph AI has now become a part of Telegraph NBA, uh, which <laughs> is, and we love acronyms, uh, which is a Telegraph Next Best Action product, which is basically a bunch of propensity models um, that try to identify um, kind of the highest um, um, likelihood of the users to buy our own products, because we sell travel, uh, we sell subscriptions and, and financial services. Um, so it's basically kind of a utilizing the same the same kind of segments, uh, but challenges. So I think I mentioned that at the beginning. Um, so the whole tagging system and annotation of the articles, that's a major, um, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a hard work to do, uh, <laughs> product team. Um, and um, it's, a, again, you can't underestimate the progress that we've made. Um, uh, okay. over over the years and and the kind of a vision that we have uh, but um, kind of as it, as it stands it's a it's a big challenge for few reasons one is that uh, the um, the the tags are very granular in a way because um, you know when when the uh, the journalist is, is to come up with a generic topic about uh, for a, you know, Maria Sharapova, whatever, uh, Wim that's probably not even related to Wimbledon, well, anyway. Um, uh, that specific article, they're just going to quickly kind of jump into something that is simple that comes to mind and or is, is kind of a, in a simplistic way suggest suggested to them, which causes the, fa the, the problem of a short-lived topic tags. Um, and, and also, as a, as a consequence, it it cause, cause it gives us a very sparse view of the of the content. So currently, uh, currently we have uh, uh, I don't remember what's the exact number, but a lot of tags uh, and three articles for each tag. Yeah, exactly, and and very number. small number of articles that have a tag, yeah. which which <laughs> means that um, that the kind of yeah the sparsity is is massive and. And, and that's a challenge. There is no kind of a more general um, abstraction uh, of, um, of, of those topics. Um, and actually, Herf is going to talk about how we address some of those challenges. And this is what takes me to Herf, uh, <laughs> who is going to talk about uh, a machine that we've built. Uh -huh, OK, I need to give it to you. Um, so uh, yes, and that, that exactly. Um, addresses that challenge about general metadata for uh, for the content and it's only one step ahead we have many steps ahead yes <laughs> okay good evening uh, <laughs> Uh, I don't know, uh, in the audience, uh, are you all familiar with uh, NLP, natural uh, 
Yeah, uh, well, okay. <laughs> Our team is saying yes. Uh, well, okay, that's good because, uh, well, obviously, when you have to work on such a presentation, you always have to make a trade off between, you know, entering into technical details or staying at a level where basically you can maintain a lot of people interested. So uh, it's kind of in between. So let's go and. Uh, so why do we need topics? So uh, Magda obviously already uh, gave us a pretty good idea of uh, what it is uh, we're talking about. And basically, uh, well, maybe what, what I mean by topic. So currently uh, we have uh, tags. So it means that every time someone is writing a new article, uh, they choose to tag uh, the article manually. Um, and we, we will see, uh, and Magda already uh, introduced you through some of the limitation of that system. Uh, topics would be something at a higher level uh, which would allow us uh, to be sure that, uh, well, we, we had that illustration of the Wimbledon effect. The one we, we used a lot last year was uh, Pokemon Go. Uh, at some point, one of the trending tag on our uh, website was Pokemon Go. Uh, today, if I want to use that tag to retrieve information, that's probably a, a tag which is dead because no one is writing about Pokemon Go today. So <laughs> we, we, you know, we have the question on how to define the topics uh, at the right level. We'll discuss th about that a little bit uh, later. So Magda gave us a, uh, uh, a great example of uh, what we're doing with content. Uh, obviously, we've been also uh, analyzing what other people are, are doing. Uh, we've been talking to Washington Post and basically uh, the project I will uh, describe today uh, has been inspired by some of the work uh, done at the Washington Post. Uh, that uh, page here is basically uh, coming uh, directly from the New York Times. Uh, and basically the New York Times is using topic uh, as the heart of the recommender system as well. So basically that section here is showing uh, the topics which have been uh, reading over the last uh, X months. And basically, they're using that then to recommend uh, stories which might be of interest uh, to me. Similarly, uh, Netflix is doing, in another field, uh, Netflix is doing uh, something uh, similar. Um, I'm coming back to that. So uh, Magrat discussed that part of uh, of, uh, of that uh, visualization. Uh, what is interesting here, so basically, uh, we took a sample of uh, our content and uh, we analyzed uh, the existing tags and we analyzed uh, the topics, so basically what we are now trying to introduce uh, for each of the articles. And uh, so each, uh, each uh, tag is related to, on average, uh, three articles. When we go at the level of our topics, uh, basically each uh, topic is related to 53 articles. If you think about you know, retrieval of information, whatever, you know, whatever system, if I want to put a search facility on the website and I want you know, to allow people to choose uh, topics, uh, that level is better than the other one. So, So how, uh, how to start and how we approach uh, that problem? Uh, so, well, obviously, uh, we, we already had a starting point. So all of our content as of today uh, was already uh, tagged. So that's something. Uh, our system is also uh, uh, adding entities uh, to, to our article. So basically, we will know uh, if an article is talking about uh, a location, uh, a person, uh, a product, so that's done uh, for us. Uh, now, what we have to do is to come with a list of topics, and basically, the trade-off we have to do is we, we, we need to put those topics at the right level because we want them to be detailed enough to give the confidence to the editorial flow that basically, you know, in the future, whatever they write about, they will find uh, a related topic and they can. Uh, be confident that it's working, but uh, it needs to be high level enough uh, to well to, to allow us to build products uh, that will allow us to to match an article which has been writing uh, written today and an article which was uh, I don't know published uh, a few months ago. Uh, 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 well, <laughs> a sad example, but one that we use. Basically, the, the idea is to to find the right uh, level in the hierarchy of topics. Um, if we talk about terrorism, so uh, if you, well, one level, one topic could be related to uh, someone. So let's say Bin Laden. So I could decide, okay, I have a topic for Bin Laden. 
Well, obviously, we had a lot of articles about Bin Laden a few years ago. Today, well, not so many articles. So if I go one level, one level uh, above that, I could say, OK, Al-Qaeda is m my right level of uh, tagging. Well, once again, we still have you know, some problems with, like, with Al-Qaeda, but we have other terror organizations today which are you know, causing more troubles. So I go once again one level above that, and I reach uh, terror, or well, terror organizations, and basically I use that as a tag. And that's giving me a level which is you know, throughout time, because I'm pretty sure that unfortunately in 10 years we'll still have terror organizations around. So basically uh, using that level of, uh, of topic will allow me to link stories published today, yesterday, and st stories that we'll publish uh, in, in the future, which is uh, one of the objectives. Uh, we're trying uh, to reach. So Magda showed us um, one usage of LDA which has been done on uh, the, the AI uh, project. In that instance, uh, we had another problem because Magda told you we are like a startup at the Telegraph and very often we have to bid and try to sell our projects you know, before they've been built. So, well, okay, so we started to talk about that idea of topics, but obviously you go to someone important and you run your ideas, but you don't have anything to, t to show them. On the other hand, building you know, the automated system that would automatically uh, re well, f retrieve a topic for all of our articles is an extremely costly process, and you know, that's a complex project which requires a, a lot of time and a lot of resource uh, to, to do. So to get started, we once again used LDA, and basically what we did, so we now have our list of topics. So we have uh, an idea of what we want. So talking with other people, uh, using our content, we established that around, you know, just above 100 topics is good enough for what we want to achieve. So we have that list of 100 topics. So how can I quickly um, find a way to take a sample of uh, our content and uh, start attributing topics to, to that content? So what we did here is we used LDA, and basically we asked LDA to retrieve for us, uh, well, to, 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 to build a, a list of uh, 100 topics. Well, LDA is doing the, the work. Uh, all we have to, to feed to LDA for that is some uh, features about our uh, content. So uh, we used uh, ngrams, uh, TFIDF on ngrams uh, for that, and it worked uh, quite well. Uh, now, as Magda showed you in her slide, uh, by doing that, what you have is topic one, two, three, but basically you don't know what those topics are about. You have words about those topics, but that's not uh, good enough. So what we did is for each of the topics, each of the hundred topics, we retrieved uh, the stories, the articles, with the highest uh, LDS scores. And basically, so now uh, human beings like me and my colleagues could start to have an idea of what each of the topics were, and we did the manual work of matching the 100 uh, LDA topics to the 100 uh, topics that we had chosen to. Well, now that's the nice version of the story. Obviously, it's, you know, it took a lot of trial and error to find the right level of granularity. Uh, for some reason, our, we had something like, I don't know, LDA was producing something like 10 or 15 uh, different uh, topics all related to football. LDA likes football uh, on our content. I don't know why, we but like well. yeah, we like football. We publish a lot about football, but uh, somehow I ended up with a list of uh, yeah, 20 topics related to football only and the rest. So a lot of trial and error, but basically at a low cost, we managed to reach a level where we could take a sample of our content and start uh, attributing uh, topics to that content. And that allowed us to build uh, the proof of concept and starting you know, to show the benefit and the interest of, of that uh, to, to the organization. And that allow us to, to, to move forward on, on the project um, that I want to discuss to that tonight. <laughs> so uh, what was missing now to go to something you know, more robust? Well, we need, uh, we need uh, an annotated uh, corpus. I don't know if you've been uh, through NLP projects, uh, annotating the content is a fun task. It's, it's massive. So where do you start, how you do it? So Magda designed, <laughs> choose the uh, volunteers in, in the team. So <laughs> uh, it was, yeah. 
Yes, it's been brilliant. Um, <laughs> one of the best experience uh, I ever had. No, but I, no. <laughs> so basically, no, the idea, the idea is we took, uh, so we were a team of three people. Uh, we took 1,500 articles, so 500 articles each. You read the article. You have a printout of the 100 topics in front of you, because remembering, you know, when you start remembering the list of the 100 topics is quite difficult for average human being. And you have a spreadsheet on your computer, so once you finish to read the, <laughs> the article, you know, it's kind of, yeah, that one is football, yeah, that one is politics, yeah, blah, blah, blah. So you do that for the, your 500 uh, articles. And then we realized that, well, okay, that's not good enough, so we actually decided that we were reading the three of us, uh, the 1,500 articles, and that we wanted a majority of uh, two to be sure that you know uh, we choose the uh, top uh, that the stuff was properly annotated. So obviously uh, that was a good experience, but it was not scaling very well. Uh, but uh, because we have plenty of creative people around in the business, we developed an application, a web application, which is allowing us to you know help us with that job of attributing topic to stories. So that helped. But uh, we said, Magda, no, enough. So we also hired some students to help us. And we ended up with a, a, a little factory of, uh, <laughs> of, uh, <laughs> yeah, of, uh, of people annotating our content. And today, uh, we have, it's over 10,000. 50,000. Yes, uh, so and uh, we, uh, quality of, uh, of annotation uh, that, well, we, we, we're happy enough with that. So that's a screenshot of the application. I don't want to enter into the details. So now we reach a point where we have annotating content. Uh, we have some ideas on how to extract features about our corpus. So uh, all we have to do is to find, well, which are the best um, features, uh, test some classification model, and uh, find a way to you know, uh, run those models. Uh, because we like to keep uh, stuff fun and because basically, you know, we've been iterating for a very long time uh, on that project. People are always coming with new ideas. We also build an internal uh, leaderboard. Uh, so the idea, you know, is to keep everyone motivated, but also to keep track of all of the combinations of uh, elements we are touching. Because we've been playing a lot with features, so different way of extracting different features. Uh, we've been playing with models. Uh, we are now playing with platforms. I will come to that uh, later. So. Um, well, some uh, ideas about a uh, first version of the, of the leaderboard. So how do we evaluate uh, all of those, uh, all of those uh, possibilities? Um, well, how do we evaluate all those models uh, that we are uh, building? Uh, well, people who are used to do classification, to work with classification problem, uh, will recognize uh, a confusion matrix. Uh, so, on those kind of problem, uh, well, basically the way it is working is um, you, you start with two classes. So, is my story talking about football? Yes, that would be positive. No, that would be um, negative. Is my uh, recommender, my classification uh, algorithm telling me that um, the story is football? Uh, yes, no. And basically, uh, the, the classification um, algorithm can make uh, two types of errors. So it can tell me that the story is about football, but actually it's not about football. So that will be a type two error. It can tell me that the story is not about football, but the story is about football. That's type one error. I'm always going to the Wikipedia page for that because I can't remember <laughs> which one is which, but I think this one is correct. Yes, okay. But uh, so basically, but uh, the important thing is, because if you read a textbook about uh, classification, everyone is talking about accuracy, but actually accuracy is not useful uh, in, in most of the, of the cases because it's, well, okay, a very good example on, on another project I'm currently working, I can reach an accuracy of 100% by predicting that everyone belongs to the negative class. Very easy, because uh, I have a problem where my positive class is only something like 0.5% 0, 0, uh, of the global uh, population. So if I'm predicting that everyone is negative, uh, in terms of accuracy, my model is perfect. 
if I go to recall, basically my model is rubbish because recall is how many of the positive my model is retrieving. And basically that brilliant 100% accuracy model is retrieving zero uh, positive uh, instances. Uh, in the context of uh, topic, um, of, of annotation, of aut automatic annotation of the content, uh, well, we, we have different use cases and different use cases would require, would be better with a high recall. Uh, some of them would be better for precision. Uh, let's say if I want to show to, I have a journalist writing a story and I have a feedback loop and I'm quickly showing to the journalist after the story has been uh, f first published the list of uh, the topics retrieved by the system. In that instance, I think recall should be uh, the one for which I'm optimizing. Let's say the journalist wrote a story about rugby and I'm telling the journalist the story is about football. Not a big deal, you know, that, that, that's all right. So in that case, retrieving as many of uh, the topics as possible is, is positive. Say if I'm building a system and I'm selling it to financial analysts and I tell them uh, with my system you can retrieve all of the stories about a particular company and basically uh, I'm typing uh, idea, IBM and uh, my system is retrieving stories which are talking about uh, anything else. <laughs> uh, BMW, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so in that instance, uh, basically precision is more important. So basically I want to be sure that the story I'm retrieving to that analyst are really talking about the topic of interest. If I'm missing a few stories, we have enough stories and it's, you know. So basically you have to choose uh, for which one uh, you optimize. So um, a lot of the discussion about, you know, how to evaluate the model is what trade-off do you do? So obviously then you have um, other scores which are combining uh, recall and precision. One of the most uh, well-known one is uh, what we call the F1 score, which is actually a harmonic mean between precision and recall. We've been using that you know, as com some kind of a default uh, when we don't have uh, a more detailed uh, use case. So, um, well, so now we have data, uh, we have annotated um, content, uh, we know how we want to evaluate our models. So stage one is what kind of features are we extracting? Uh, well, the obvious one when you start playing with NLP is bag of words. So you take all of uh, the words in your documents, uh, count the frequency, then you improve that by uh, doing uh, what we call uh, TF-IDFs. So basically you start to weight uh, the importance of each terms in the document by the frequency of the, of, of the term. So let's say if my corpus is only about football, uh, some uh, specific uh, words related only to football are not of interest to classify uh, that text. So basically TF-IDF will allow me, that's a methodology that will allow me <coughs> to downweight uh, uh, words which are appearing in a, a, a massive percentage of my, of my corpus. So. Uh, well, you start there, go to TF-IDF, then using what each word in isolation is good, but you start you know, playing with what we call n-grams. So instead of looking for one single word in isolation, you start by looking by uh, bigrams, which are groups of two words occurring together, and you carry on. So played with that for a little while. Then, somehow, <laughs> We, well, well I, I will discuss that later on, but uh, some architecture consideration made us move uh, to the Google uh, Cloud Machine Learning Platform, okay? We, we've already seen that a lot of our data is already sitting in Google. Um, cloud Machine Learning is coming with TensorFlow, so I don't know if you, there is a lot of buzz currently around uh, TensorFlow. Uh, that's basically a framework uh, mainly designed uh, to, to, to code uh, neural networks uh, architecture. So that's in Python, you code your neural network uh, using that TensorFlow uh, library, and then basically you push your TensorFlow uh, model to be trained and scored uh, on the Google Cloud Machine Learning. 
starting to think about that, no one in the team was really coming from a neural net uh, with, with a lot of neural net uh, experience and stuff. But uh, what we realized is that uh, actually the kind of engrams and the bag of words uh, features are not working really well uh, with neural nets, which are requiring very dense feature. Uh, bag of words is the opposite of dense because as, as a feature, you have a count of the frequency of all of the words of the English language. So you end up with dimensionality in the tens of thousands. So it's really, really the opposite of, of dense. So we started to investigate uh, how to build uh, dense features, and we started uh, to, to do more and more readings about uh, word embeddings. And, and basically, uh, that's been uh, a very good uh, uh, find for, for, for the rest of the project. So what are word embeddings? So the idea is I take uh, a space, uh, an n-dimensional space. Uh, I think, well, the simplest one will be two dimensions, so the plan x, y, uh, uh, axis. But there, basically, I can choose how many uh, dimensions I want. Then I put all of the words of the English language into that uh, space. And basically, I train a model that will organize the words in such a manner that words with similar meanings are sitting in position, or in, are, are closely, um, are, are located close to each other in my, uh, in my space. Okay? So, you have models, uh, one very popular search model is uh, word to vec So uh, that's a model which has been uh, um, created at Google. Uh, well, that's coming from PhD thesis, but the guy now is working at Google. Uh, and there is a lot of buzz around that, that model. And actually, it's quite good. Uh, I've been very impressed by, uh, by, by the results of that model. So with that uh, word to vec uh, well, uh, word embeddings uh, idea, you can, uh, you can reach very dense representation of your document. So remember, we were in the tens of thousands. I'm not, no joke, we're now down to 300. So dimension, or the, the number of features I need to describe a document are 300. So that's brilliant. And then basically, you have plenty of other uh, funny stuff coming with a uh, word embeddings model, because you have all of those uh, all of your words uh, in that uh, space, you can start to apply some kind of uh, pseudo uh, vector operations on the words. One of the, the examples that they like to show to everyone is if you ask uh, your word to vec model, what is the result of king minus man plus woman? The answer is queen. So that's quite interesting. Or for example, you can ask the model, give me uh, words similar to Obama, and, uh, well, you will have uh, Clinton, Trump appearing closely related to, to that. So basically, that's, that's, that's interesting, and there is a, a, an interesting intuition you can play with. So there are plenty of applications of, uh, of uh, word embeddings. So, well, you find about word 2 vec so what is your first uh, reaction? Let's train a word 2 vec model. So we started, took our content. Uh, well, that's painful. Uh, word to vec is actually quite slow to train, so it's very, very uh, difficult to train um, a, a good uh, word to vec model. Plus, uh, and everyone is, you find that everywhere, every time you read an article about word to vec uh, the more training uh, article, uh, the more training uh, uh, text uh, sample you show to the model, the better the model is becoming. So with my 10,000 uh, articles, I had a, well, an interesting model, but it was nowhere too perfect. Actually, Google is providing a test for those kind of models. And the test was, again, very funny because it's, it's based on semantics. So basically, the test that your model has to pass is stuff like uh, London is to the UK, like Paris is to what? And basically, you see if your model is finding France. And uh, they have a list of thousands of such examples, and basically you score your model on how many correct answers the model has. So we did that with our model. It was kind of, yeah, well, not so bad for something, you know, built <laughs> like that. And then we, we found, yeah, <laughs> no, but it, it, it was okay. It was okay-ish. <laughs> yes, exactly. And then <laughs> we found that uh, Google is providing a pre-trained uh, road to vec model. Uh, Somewhere I read, they claim that it's been trained on billion of documents. I don't know if that's even possible, but it's blowing my mind. But apparently, it's been anyway. That's massive corpus. Uh, 
they used uh, the uh, Google News content to train the model. So for us, in terms of, because you could think, I don't know, if I was working on a medical specific domain, you might think, well, maybe the Google corpus is so different from mine. But there, they, they trained it on Google News, so somehow it's related to our news content. So we use that, and basically, you grab that model from Google, that's quite a big file, but you download it, and then what you have is for each words, well, that's actually n-grams, for a, a pretty big list of n-grams, you have a vector representation. So you take Rob, and in the word to vec uh, Google model, word will be represented as a vector of 300 elements. Magda as well. Me not, because of my name. It's French. No, I'm not in the model. I tested it. <laughs> <laughs> so you end up with uh, those vectors for all of the words of the language. So now the next question is, how do you combine uh, all of those vectors, which are related to a word, into a document, uh, into the representation of a document? Uh, well, obviously, when you start thinking about it, you over-engineer the problem, and then you find some article, and you find that people are adding the vectors, are averaging the vector, are uh, adding and applying some kind of TF-IDF weights uh, to the vectors. Actually, we found that adding the vectors is bringing you a long way. So I'm <laughs> very surprised about that, because the intuition is a little bit weird, because when you see all of those vectors, you have the feeling that the addition is probably not the best operation to, to synthesize you know, the, 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 the meaning of the document, but it seems to work. So we started with that, and uh, well, it's once again working. So the idea is you start, um, well, you have, uh, and, and basically tr um, scoring your, your document is becoming very easy, because all you have to do is you, you scan your document, take all of the words, well, obviously you can exclude some elements that you want to exclude, but uh, let's say you take all of the words, uh, retrieve their vector, sum all of the vectors, and you have your 300 features for the document. So, uh, yeah, so 300 uh, features for each document. Uh, remember, we're starting from tens of thousands of features. Predictive power, well, uh, with that very naive approach, we haven't we haven't seen you know, a massive jump in the quality of, uh, of the model we're building, but we haven't seen a degradation, and we were slightly do doing slightly better than you know, the more difficult to build uh, features. So somehow, and I'm talking about traditional models, so I'm talking about uh, neural nets, I'm talking about logistic regressions, uh, switching from my very uh, sparse uh, n-grams to uh, my uh, word embeddings uh, actually was slightly improving the quality of my, uh, of my uh, model, so that was good. And uh, that's also because, remember, we made that decision to move to uh, Google, uh, well, to, to TensorFlow and um, Google ML. That's also allow opening the door of the, 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 the neural network uh, capabilities of the platform. So now the model, so what was our approach? Uh, well, once again, that's you know, a matter of intuition. So if you ask me, you have 100 models, uh, sorry, you have 100 uh, topics, you need to, uh, to attribute those topics to all of your corpus, what would you do? Uh, I would go for a multi-class uh, classification. I don't know, that was my intuition. Someone in the team had a very strong opinion about the fact that actually uh, doing a binary uh, classification for each of the topic would work better. And actually, we tested both, and he was right. Uh, doing, having a 100 model binary classification, so is it football? Yes, no. Is it politics? Yes, no. Is actually uh, the approach which is uh, giving you uh, the, 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 the best uh, possible results. And one of the benefits uh, no one was thinking about, but it's becoming quite important, it's allow you, uh, first of all, uh, to have a specific model for each of the topics. So let's say if for some reason one topic is more difficult to predict, well, basically you can 
start playing with that topic in isolation, play with different features, play with different models. So you work on, some, on, a, on a very small subset of the bigger problem. Plus, uh, remember, uh, there is a lot of debate about, you know, okay, I have a hundred topics. Is everyone in the organization happy about that? Certainly not. So at some point, someone will ask me to add a new topic and people will ask me to remove topics. So the fact of having those individual models is giving me a lot of uh, flexibility. Uh, well, I already mentioned the platform, but uh, so uh, obviously initial tests. So uh, originally we were an R shop. <laughs> so uh, we were doing most of our work in R. Uh, now we have more and more. We've been last year, uh, we did a lot of work on proper data products, a lot of uh, research on uh, recommendation engines. Uh, now some NLP, well, more and more NLP. So basically we s gently switched from R to uh, Python and also some of the new hires uh, that we brought in the team uh, were coming with a Python background. So we, you know, depending on the task, uh, we work in R, let's say, for most of the ad hoc analysis and uh, so, well, I don't want to enter into a war about Python or R, but basically we're covering both. This project was developed in Python and we use scikit-learn uh, to build our uh, initial models. Uh, because of the scale of the stuff, so we wanted to keep it simple. Uh, like Rob, uh, we like uh, logistic regression, so we started with naive base and logistic regression, and it worked quite well. And, uh, well, now, uh, coming back to the model, but uh, so basically, our problem is still highly complex because we have a hundred of models, we have uh, difficult uh, content, it's only text-based, we don't have any numerical, uh, well, we don't have, um, e everything is, uh, yeah, unstructured uh, data. Uh, so we had a lot of questions about um, which infrastructure to use. And basically the idea of us, well, we started to work with uh, the data engineering team because we are lucky enough we have uh, a data science team, but we also have a data engineering team, so the people looking at the, after the platforms and stuff. So when we started to, to tell them of our idea to have uh, so many models to train on, on an ad hoc uh, Python uh, scikit-learn box, they were kind of worried about you know, the cost of maintaining that box and uh, how that would work and stuff. So their recommendation, they, they tried to put a, push us towards uh, Google, uh, Google Cloud uh, Machine Learning. So uh, that's how we ended up. And today, basically, uh, all of our prototypes are working in, uh, in Google Cloud Machine Learning. And basically, that's where the project will be developed. Uh, you're losing a little bit of flexibility in terms of, well, you are in scikit-learn. Uh, you think about the classification uh, algorithm. You have it. It's available. Uh, you land on, uh, on Google Cloud uh, machine learning. It's basically uh, more restrictive in terms of the algorithms which are there uh, today or when we started to work there. So it was, logistic regression is available because uh, a logistic regression is somehow a cert that's, um, that's an extreme simplification of, uh, of, of, of well, neural net and, and the, the maths to express uh, a neural net and uh, a logistic regression is the same. So basically you can train a logistic regression thanks to that property in, in, in TensorFlow. So basically the models we tried were um, in, in, on the Google Cloud machine learning platform were uh, logistic regression and some uh, s simple uh, neural net uh, model. So uh, the, the platform uh, and TensorFlow is giving us uh, many tools which allow you uh, to, to optimize, not obviously the, the, all of the layers of your architecture, but you can say, I want so many layers, and uh, you can use TensorFlow flow to optimize uh, the number of, um, of uh, nodes that you will have in, in all of the hidden layers. So we use a little bit of that. Uh, for the time being, but once again, remember our background is not really into deep learning. Uh, but it's interesting enough because we are kind of, you know, at the same level that we were with logistic regression. So we don't know. We might be, you know, pretty close to a massive breakthrough. And because of the magic of uh, deep, 
you know, uh, deep learning, we will reach, you know, a level of uh, F1 score, uh, which is, you know, never seen before. But currently it's interesting enough because there is not a mass massive difference between logistic regression and, uh, and neural net as we see it from, from where we are. So uh, that's where we are as of today. So uh, we are working uh, with different teams now in the organization. So engineers, uh, a few people in data science. We have Brian here who is now our champion on the, on the project. <laughs> so, uh, and, and basically the next challenges will be that. It will be uh, bringing that you know, to a scale uh, where we can confidently, every time a new story is published, you know, run uh, a model that will retrieve for us uh, the topics. We even have uh, you know, the, the, the ideal idea, if we project ourselves you know, a few months or a few years in the future, we even see the possibility of having a feedback loop, automated and everything. So basically, uh, you sh the journalist publish uh, the story, the system is immediately retrieving uh, the topics, show them to the journalist, and the journalist is giving you a feedback by saying you, nah, it's not football, or oh, you forgot to say that it was rugby, and you use that feedback to retrain the model, blah, 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 blah. But we're not there yet. And, uh, but, uh, but basically, for those of you interested to join the team, we still have a few. <laughs> My God, I'm good at this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we still have a few uh, interesting uh, projects uh, for, for, for the coming months and years. So thank you. Thank you. Um,